Hi, everybody. Welcome. You're almost there. You're almost, you're almost to a three-day weekend. Precious few breaks in the fall, right? That pathetic little fall break that's just like, what, two days long or something? I was talking to somebody the other night about this. Like, why don't, why don't we get a full week like in the spring? It's, I need that week. I love that week. That week. Is, is it just me in the spring? Like, if not for spring break, I don't know if I'd make it. <clears throat> okay. Today we're talking about the Eleatic Monists. Eleatic Monists. Why do we call them the Eleatic Monists? Well, because they're Monists and they're from Elia, right? So, and it's a very particular brand of monism. It's a little different than we've seen so far. Matter of fact, everybody that we've seen so far can be classified, I think, more or less loosely in some form of monism. Possible exception there of Heraclitus, but even, even him, we could squeeze him in somehow. Um, help, help me run down the list. Who have we talked about so far? There's the Milesians. Who are they? Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. Okay, good. And then after that, there was Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. Is it clear how all of them could be classified as monists? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the Milesians as material monists, like we were sketchy about the materialism part for, for Anaximander, but he's still a monist, right? Everything is the apparon. Um... And Thales, everything is water. There's the monism. And Anaximenes, everything is air. air. And there's the monism. Pythagoras, everything is mathematical, mathematical ratio. Again, like one, one sort of thing, right? So another monus, mathematical monus, perhaps. And then we might say, whoa, whoa, whoa there, Pythagoras. But aren't there many numbers? And then we might be like, ooh, yeah, all right, now there's a puzzle. Yeah. Would Pythagoras also say there's like a soul? There's a soul and it's immortal, but we might also, like, we have not a whole lot of elaboration on what the nature of that soul is. We might get some version of that from Plato, specifically in Phaedo, when we start talking about uh, the nature of the soul, or what Socrates thinks the nature of the soul is, or what Plato, the words that Plato is putting into Socrates' mouth about what the nature of the soul is. And I believe I mentioned, if not last time, then when we were talking about the Pythagoreans, that... They're a huge influence on Plato. In fact, after Socrates dies, he goes and studies with the Pythagoreans. He goes to, to Italy for a little while and stays there for a while. Yeah. Yes? Uh, on the writing assignment, you want us to distinguish the two um, material monists and the Elysians. Uh, so the and the, the material monists and, um, and just something else. Right. Yeah, what, what would be the difference between like a, a materialistic RK? That the, the sort that we talk about, the, the Milesians adopting, and an abstract sort of RK. Well, could I say something like the material monists use methods that are established to come up with a theory about it? Or well, on the other kind of, they have a theory, they kind of work in reverse. They take theories and try to make something out of it. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to hear more uh, to, to well, I'm know. To yeah. It. Well, I want, you to tell me, I want you to tell me which of the two categories you think an Aximander ought to belong in. So in order to do that, yes, you'll have to distinguish the two categories. But that's, that's, a, that's a task on the way to the main task, right? The main task is, like, where does an Aximander actually go? And in order to do that, you'll have to say, like, okay, so here's, here's what this group is. Here's the, here's the difference between the two. And now we've got to figure out which way an Aximander falls on that difference. After Pythagoras? Xenophanes, who said that there was just one God. Ah, there's that monism again, right? Okay. And then last but not least, Heraclitus. Should we call him a monist? <coughs> Why not? Yeah, yeah, there's a good one. So, like, if everything is constantly in change, then there's no sameness. No sameness, we can't talk about unity, right? There's just kind of, like, infinite plurality and difference. Then again, he does say everything is changed. There's one fundamental principle, one fundamental arche of the cosmos, and it's one thing, it's change, right? Or it's fire, or fire as a metaphor for change, or it's strife or war, 
or something like that. Then, then again, ah, yeah, we have a couple of different things. Are they all different facets of the same one thing? And then again, when we follow the logic of that one thing, it turns out that there isn't one thing. There are, in fact, many things, so many things, way more things than you thought there were. Like, for example, you. There are way more yous than you thought there were. In fact, a different you from moment to moment. Yeah, dicey to call them a monist there. The Eleatic monists are doing something slightly different. And yet, slightly the same. They are definitely monists. They're not talking, however, about one particular principle. The argument here that's being put forth by the Eleatic monists is that everything is, in fact, just one unified thing. No specification of what that one unified thing is, what it's like, just that there is unity. And similar to this, this thought process that we were just having now about, like, well, Heraclitus, if everything is changed, then we have this infinite plurality of things, I suppose. With the Eleatic monist, specifically Parmenides, we get this idea that unity is a way deeper, trippier idea than we possibly would have thought before getting into this. A couple of things worth mentioning about the Eleatic monist, uh, or specifically Parmenides. Let's start with Parmenides. Parmenides was, um, by many accounts, kind of like a shaman type guy. He was a uh, he was a local wise man in Elia. Elia is here on the west coast of what today is Italy. You can still go there today. There are ruins. Um, so yeah, he was kind of like wise man, medicine man, stuff like this. Um, some accounts have him practicing in a certain kind of uh, an Orphic ritual. You guys know the myth of Orpheus? At all, Orpheus had to go. Where, what? Where did Orpheus go? Yeah, he went to the underworld, right? Orpheus went where like living people are not supposed to go. He went to the realm of the dead, and then he came back. Tried to save his wife. Didn't didn't work out though, right? Yeah, he did the Lot's wife thing. He looked back. Yeah, not supposed to look back. So Orpheus went to the land of the dead, and then he came back, and. The Pythagoreans were onto this too. They were big into Orphic myths. This idea that, like, in death, something can be learned. And the whole trick here to wisdom or insight or enlightenment, whatever you want to call it, is to grab onto that insight that we have when we're dead and bring it back into the, the world of the living. With the Pythagoreans, it was this idea that, like, your true self is not your body and that the death of your body is a liberation of the immaterial soul to where it can go be someplace better. We're going to get more elaboration on that from Plato. For Parmenides, and there's historical disagreement about this, but plenty of accounts that would say things that um, he engaged in practices like fasting for days and going up into the mountains and lying down in a dark cave, motionless, for days. Stop eating. Go to a quiet place where you can't hear anything, dark cave where you can't see anything, lie motionless so you don't really like feel your body. As a matter of fact, it's an effort to try to make your body recede into the background so that the mind can wake up, have insights. You don't eat and you lie motionless in a dark place for a couple of days. You're going to see some stuff. <laughs> and Parmenides did. The idea here being, though, that these are insights, right? These are revelations. If we're thinking about like this, well, now Parmenides sounds he's more of a religious figure than a philosophical figure. If we're talking about divine revelation, as a matter of fact, what's going on in this poem of his? What we're reading and the, 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 big, the big set of fragments that come from Parmenides um, are in this poem, Perifuseos. Or um, On Nature. Yeah, he meets a goddess, and the goddess tells him the truth. We have some divine revelation again. So this would seem to make Parmenides on the outskirts of our category of philosophers. He's engaging in what we might think is a slightly different kind of a practice. Again, just like science and philosophy aren't completely disentangled from one another, religion and philosophy aren't completely disentangled from one another, are going to continue to not be very uh, uh, disentangled from one another for another couple thousand years. 
But despite the fact that on nature this whole poem is perhaps provoked by a practice that today we would say is designed to generate hallucinations, despite the fact that he's talking about some kind of divine revelation from a goddess, there is an argument here, a striking argument, an impressively tight rational argument, something that I might go so far as to call a proof. In fact, I would say this is very different than anything else we've read so far, if for no other reason than the length of it is longer than, like before we've had fragments and they're tiny, tiny fragments. We have fragments of Parmenides' poem here as well, but they all seem to be part of the same poem and historians and philologists have tried to put them together in a logical order. And it tells a story. Not only does it tell a narrative story, it's long enough for him to make an argument, an argument through, that he makes through the goddess. And it is a rational argument. First time we've seen this. We've had folks who are kind of trying to reason through things or we're guessing that they're trying to reason through things. We have folks like Heraclitus or even Anaximander who give us little puzzles that we pick up and we think through. But this is the first time that we've seen somebody think through a problem step by step and we see their rationale. We see their argument. Some folks, myself included, would be tempted to say, yeah, everything else was like maybe it was philosophy already. Maybe it was just proto-philosophy. By the time we hit Parmenides, it's definitely Western philosophy as we know it. This might be the beginning of the tradition as we know it. Specifically a tradition of rationalism. And by rationalism I mean trusting to the rational faculties. To the exclusion of other faculties in fact too. What other faculties do we have besides rationality that we might be tempted, oh, like, what do I trust? Do I trust this or do I trust rationality? Emotions, Emotions perhaps, okay, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Religion. Religion. Anything else? Other people, perhaps? All right. Testimony? Anything else? There's one. There's, it, was, it was the one I was fishing for from the start. Nobody said it yet. What's that? Morality? Uh, not necessarily distinct from rationality. <clears throat> Senses, senses. The way things have always been, we might say um, tradition, similar enough to the way that religion is working right now, the senses. That's the, that's the big one. And, sto and so starts a battle that some would argue is still ongoing in philosophy. The rationalist versus the empiricist. Which is more trustworthy? The way things make sense to our rational faculties. Maybe, maybe make sense is the wrong word there, right? The way things... Yeah, I got nothing else. Make sense. The way things make sense to our rational faculties versus the way that they seem to our empirical sensory faculties, right? There's the way that things look, smell, taste, touch, the way that they seem to our bodily senses. And then there's the way that they appear to our thinking rational faculty. And sometimes, these things are not in agreement with one another. When we think through a problem, we get to one conclusion. When we try to work our way through the problem by appealing to the senses, we get a different conclusion. We're wondering, oh, well, which one, is, which one is the correct one? A rationalist will say, guess, guess which one the rationalist wants to trust? Rationality, right? They trust to rationality. And what we've got here with Parmenides is this question about the world seeming one way to our senses 
But another way according to rationality and Parmenides and Zeno will both say, yeah, not that one, that one. How is it that things seem to our senses? Well, it seems to our senses that there are many things. There's me, there's you, there's this thing here, there's this thing here. There are all kinds of different things. And over time, they move around and they change. Some things come into being. Some things pass away, out of being. They perish. Some things stick around for a little while. Some things stick around for a long while. That's the way it seems to our senses. According to rationality, though, maybe none of these things are true. And this is what we get in our poem. Three big parts of this poem, usually known as the, the proem, or the, some, some sort of preamble. There's the way of truth, and the word that Parmenides is using here for truth is aletheia. An interesting term here, aletheia. <clears throat> I want to break it down. It's aletheia, right? Again, we have an alpha privative prefix there that says no. And lethe, does anybody, I don't know how good is your Greek mythology here. Lethe, does this ring a bell for anybody? There's a river in the underworld called the river Lethe. When you cross it, you're supposed to drink a little bit from it. And when you do, you forget everything. This is why... When you come back, perhaps, and talk about Pythagoreans, go to the underworld. If you were ever to come back, you would have no memory of your previous life. Ah, uh, lethea, an unforgetting. This is truth, right? Kind of like an uncovering of something that was hidden. Seeing things the way they are. And then, last but not least, the way of seeming, maybe, we might try to translate. The word here is doxa. where doxa refers to beliefs or opinions. Sometimes folks will call this the way of opinion. The way things seem versus the way of truth and some kind of preamble. What's going on in the preamble? Set, set this up for me. What happens in this poem? I already mentioned he talked to a goddess. How does he get to the goddess? A bear. Wait, a bear? No, I don't think it's a bear. Might have, we might have oh, caught some kind of mystery. Like horse? Yeah. horse. Yeah, there were horses involved in a chariot, right? There are horses that carried him in a chariot to where? Justice. To justice? Past justice. Justice is doing something. Justice is justice is manning the gates. What gates? Night and day. The gates of night and day. Yeah. The gates of night and day. Parmenides is carried by young maidens and horses in a chariot to the gates of night and day and beyond the gates of night and day where justice is kind of manning this gate, where justice is kind of patrolling. Who gets to go beyond the gates of night and day? And the maidens whisper something to justice and let him know that, like, it's okay. He's allowed through and he goes through. Justice lets him through the gates of night and day. What does this mean to go beyond the gates of night and day? You're not seeing things because you see the light and you, like, you don't see the light of the darkness. Yeah, night, night and day, yeah. With night and day, we have like a, a light and then later a darkness, as if they're two things. We're going beyond this, right? Beyond the opposition. It's like past senses. Like... Past the senses, yeah. Anything else beyond the... Yeah. Transcendence. Transcendence. Beyond, tr what are we transcending? Simple dualities like night and day? And our, our faculties. Our, yeah, our sensory faculties. Okay, yep, we're going some places. Is he, like, perhaps, is this, a, can we think of, is this a dream? Is this a hallucination that he's having in a cave somewhere outside of Elia? Is he dead? This is another, like, easy translation, or, or tempting translation, at least, of what's going on with this, like, beyond the nights, the gates of night and day, is that he's taken to the underworld. He's taken to the place of the dead. The goddess lets him know, it's no ill fate that brought you here. You're not really dead. It's not a bad thing. It's just and right that you're here, because coming here, you will learn the way of unfailing truth. 
I'm also going to tell you the way of seeming, which is not reliable at all. And is the path that is like the preferred path of the, the silly two-headed mortals who wander confused, with confusion in their breast, their heads on backwards, coming and going and not really sure which way they're going or coming or anything like this. I'm going to tell you both of them because you have to know them both. Why do we have to know them both? In order to distinguish between them? Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, that sounds plausible. We have to know them both in order to distinguish between them. And then I'll send you back with this argument, by the way, so that when other people ask, like, what happened? You're like, the God has told me. If somebody comes to you and says, like, God told me, blah, 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 are you going to be like, ooh, let's, let's hear, this is going to be important? Or would you be like, Somebody comes to you and tells you that God told them something. Do we think they might be crazy? And if they said something that seemed surprising, even if we, did, if we were like, I would, this I got to hear. God spoke to you. Let's hear what it is. And they said, like, well, here's what it is. You know the way the world seems? Not really like that at all. Not even close. It's completely different than the way the world seems. You got to stop thinking of it that way. Think of it this way instead. Why? Because God told me. I, I, God didn't tell me. What, should I trust you? What's going on here? Except that we get an argument. There's an account. There's a logos given by the goddess so that Parmenides can remember this when he goes back to the other side of the gates of night and day and so that he has something to tell other folks as well in a language that they will understand. All right, so that's what's going on in the proem and the preamble. We go beyond the gates of night and day. And there's all kinds of imagery here that some folks will make big fuss over and say uh, that this is, this is more proof that this is a kind of like an Orphic ritual uh, with hallucination and stuff like that. Like there's a reference to like the sound of the, the shrill sound of the axle as it spins on the chariot and how it sounds like pipes. And some folks will say that like if you fast for a long period of time and sit in the dark and don't move, you'll get a kind of a ringing in your ears that supposedly folks like Parmenides thought like, this is the music of the spheres, this is like the sound, the harmony of the cosmos that the Pythagoreans are all talking about. I hear it, I hear it with this kind of ooh. If you don't eat for three days, you'll hear the music of the spheres. It's a B flat. <laughs> Beyond the gates of night and day, And interesting, too, that justice is the one who patrols the gates of night and day. Why justice? And he meets the goddess. And the goddess tells him that he needs to learn these two things. The way of truth, the path of truth, and the path of seeming. What's the path of truth like? Or how does this start? I said there's an argument from the goddess. What is the content of this argument? How does it begin? What are its premises? Yes? Is that the truth? Yep. Pretty easy start, right? That which is, is. That which is not, is not. Perhaps the two most uncontroversial premises in the history of philosophy, maybe even vacantly true, tautologically true. Who cares? Like, do I learn anything new at all from that which is, is, and that which is not, is not? Is there anybody who disagrees with this? Is he like, no, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not sure I'm ready to get on board with that which is, is. Depends on what the definition of is. Does it depend on what the definition of is, is? Or could the definition of is be anything and still that which is, is? Like, what if is means is a fire truck? That which is a fire truck is a fire truck. 
Is could mean something else. It could mean jumps around and sings a song. That which jumps around and sings a song, jumps around and sings a song. Does it even matter what the definition of is is? Or what that which is, is. And that which is not, is not. Yes? That which is, is not? Yes. Makes sense. All right, this is maybe a good starting point. Is there anybody else who's like, that which is, is not, is, yeah, that makes sense to me as well. That which is, is not. How is this not just a naked contradiction? That which is, is not. Let's try, again, let's try to substitute for anything else. That which is a water bottle is not a water bottle. No, Am I talking nonsense? Uh, love. That, which is love. that which is is n that which is a water bottle is not a mug. Yeah, perhaps that makes sense to us, right? So that which is a water bottle is not a mug, but that which is. Oh, that which is one thing maybe is not some other thing. So it can't be a water bottle and mug at the same time. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we have different meanings of is. Is might mean the same thing both times. Yeah. We just provide a little extra something, right? So in fact, we wouldn't have that which is, is, because you're saying that which is a water bottle is, a is not a mug. Yeah. And so we don't actually have the same thing in both of these places. We say that which is one thing is not some other thing, perhaps. But, we, but you wouldn't go so far as to say that which is one thing is not that same one thing. That's crazy talk, right? Agree? Everybody agree? That which is one thing is n can't, we can't then turn right back around and go, and it's also not one thing, or that one thing. That would be a contradiction? Yes? So like looking at the, just going back like, a second to the um, beyond like the gates of night and day, so that's kind of like talking about like perception and like, you know, like recognizing like the illusions that like your senses can give you. So could you say something like, um, that which is like I don't know some like falsity that like your senses would tell you, like um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, unfortunately. But like if your senses told you something that was wrong, like if I was hallucinating, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's that's how it is. Like that's how you think that it is, but it's actually. But not it's actually not that way. way. It seems one way, but it is another way, right? But whichever way it is, it's not not that way, right? However something is, it's not not that way? Not not, like knots are, knots are little negations, right? They can double negate. To not not be a way is to be a way. Does that make sense? That which is, is. And that which is not, is not. Seemingly not very controversial on its own. Yes? Yeah, well, we're wondering, yeah, this is, this is going want, to, I want us to not focus on that too much just now because we're going to come back around to it. Maybe this is a way to, like, open up a little crack in Parmenides' logic and, and see what we can do there. But for now, let's just focus. Instead of thinking about it is one way and it's not some different way, let's just look at it the way that Parmenides offers it. That which is, is. And in fact, let's not think of it in terms of predication necessarily. Is... A water bottle is your professor is tired, is hungry, right? Just is. That's a peculiar statement. That which is, is. It's got everything it needs to be a complete sentence there, but do, does it feel a little bit like it's maybe incomplete? That which is, is. And you're like, is, is what? It is. It exists. Is it perhaps a little clearer now? That which exists, exists. And that which does not exist, does not exist? Well. And here's the weird thing, and immediately, right off the bat, 
the goddess points out that like that which is is totally sensible statement. I'm going to also like say this other thing, which is a key premise for us, but I'm going to put a big asterisk by it. There's like there's a flag, there's a star, there's like a warning that comes along with that which is not is not is already a weird statement. And the reason why it's a weird statement is because that which is not is not. For just a moment, I, let me just tell you guys up front, I don't have a brother. I don't have any brothers. I have a sister. She's younger. She's three years younger than me. She's a physical therapist. She's pregnant. She's having a baby in January. She's great. Her name is Lauren. Um, um, but I don't have any brothers. Are my non-existent brothers tall? Are they short? Do they have red hair, beards, big muscles? What's like? They don't exist. They don't exist. Can I say anything truthful about them at all? No. You don't speculate. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it might even be weird to say that they don't exist. Because now I am talking about them having some property, namely the property of non-existence. But they don't exist to even have that property of non-existence. This is an absurd statement to say that my, even to say that my non-existent brothers don't exist, which seems straightforward and tautological, is already running into some weird difficulties. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I saw it. Like, I, I feel real bad about it too because it was like you seemed like you really had something to say, and then I said like, wait, hold on, let me say this really weird thing. If you think of it, let me know. Yes. What do you mean? Yeah, it might be that it's, and in fact, this seems to be the point of the goddess, is that it's beyond the logos. Like, non-being. Here's another way. Instead of talking about existence and non-existence, we can talk about being and non-being. And let's put it this way. Being is. Non-being ain't. Which is to say... There is no non-being. Careful. I, may, I maybe just did like a little sleight of hand move there. Everything that I was saying was just fine. That which is, is. That which is not, is not. That which exists, exists. Yeah, of course. That which does not exist, does not exist. And if it doesn't exist, can I even say that it doesn't exist? It's kind of weird to talk about it not existing. Same way that it would be weird to talk about my non-existent brothers at all let alone having particular properties, even the properties of non-existence. Here we go again. Being is, non-being isn't, which is to say, there is no non-being. Am I okay so far? Have I made any, any bad false moves? Where do you make the, the, the jump from there is no non-being? Yeah. Because if there was non-being, then non-being would be. And non-being can't be because it isn't. Because if non-being bead, then it would be being. Okay. Yes. So you're, you're saying that non-being is... I'm not saying it. The goddess is saying it. Okay. But yeah. So, okay. So basically, the goddess is saying that um, non-being is a trait. The trait can only be uh, associated with being. Yes. Yes. So if you're associating a... Uh, trait that belongs to a being to a non-being, then you're actually contradicting yourself because that non-being shouldn't have that property in the first place, so you yep. really can't refer to it at all, right? You're making no sense. You shouldn't even speak of non-being. No. You can't speak sensibly about non-being. Anything you try to say of non-being is going to be absurd and incoherent. A log on, right? Outside of the logos. You cannot speak coherently about non-being. As soon as you try to, you confuse being and non-being. You try to talk about non-being as if it bees. But it don't bees. <laughs> non-being doesn't be. It doesn't even non-be. You can't talk coherently about it. So a non-being... Oh, no, yeah, hold on to it. Like, a non-being yeah, okay. Keep, keep it in the oven for a little longer. Yeah. So if you talk about non-being, does it make it a mean that you talk about it? 
Is this how, like this would be like pretty magical, right? I would just have to say the words and things would come into existence? And there are some statements that work like this. Um, yeah, I wasn't thinking of like kind of ontological argument type stuff. I was thinking more of like performative language. So um, I I hereby I hereby promise to end class at twelve fifteen. Is that statement true? Wait, no, not that I will end class at 15. I hereby promise to end class at 12.15. Do I promise? I just did, right? In the saying it, I made it true. But you don't have to follow that promise. I don't have to follow that promise, but I did promise, right? And it's the making the promise that makes the promise, right? It's the making the promise that makes the promise. It's the making the promise that makes the statement that says I'm making the promise true. I now pronounce you man and wife is another one that's like, it wasn't true until I said it. And as soon as I said it, it became true because I said it. Um, maybe, but that's not, that's, it's not like, well, may, like, let there be light. <laughs> There's light. Two-headed mortals don't pull that off though, right? Becomes real to, like, when you say becomes real to you, do you mean that it seems that way? Yeah. Yeah. At the risk of like us kind of drifting off into like cliche undergraduate philosophical territory, like what are chairs, man? They're just like a social construction. Like maybe there, maybe there are chairs, but like seeming ain't the same as being, right? Or seeming isn't the same as truth. So things might seem a certain way to us. That doesn't make them real for us. Now, this is a problem, by the way, that's going to go on, like, it's no, like Parmenides drops it like, like a big stinking turd in the middle of Philosophyville. And, like, it sticks around. Like, Bertrand Russell is wringing his hands over this in the 1940s. Folks are still wondering about this. Um, might look into a fellow named Alexis Meinong, who wrote some interesting stuff on this, too, where he would say, he said something along the lines of um, anything that you can think of or speak of, unicorns, like, three-headed dogs, all things like that. They do exist, but they exist some, in some other realm of like fictional things. Meinong's jungle, they call it. Oh, M-E-I-N-O-N-G. He's not the most highly respected philosopher in the history of philosophy, but he's definitely, he's got this very interesting thing going on. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In first meditation, Descartes, or second meditation, Descartes says, "I'm thinking." Right. Same sort of thing. I'm thinking. In fact, I'm talking might be one of those things where, yeah, like, you could be, you could fool yourself about it. You could think you were talking when, in fact, you were dreaming and not talking at all. But yeah, sure. If we trust that you are talking, yeah, saying I'm talking guarantees the truth that I'm talking for sure. Is it ready? Yeah. Okay. So If you fail to acknowledge the non-existence of a non-being? Yep. <laughs> That's what I was trying to form in my head. Like, are you saying, like, if I confuse a non-being with being? If I think that a non-being exists? When you said that uh, if you, you acknowledge that, like, you don't have any brothers, can you really talk about them even though they don't exist? Yeah, I can try, but I won't make sense. But, yeah, but in concept, it's... You're, not, you're still acknowledging the non-existence of your, the brothers that, that you don't have. By saying that they don't exist? By saying that they don't exist. So if you don't Doesn't it seem like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have it both ways? If you don't think about it, though. If you don't think about it. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, sure, perhaps. Yeah, if you don't think about it. Yeah. Totally. Let me introduce you to this fellow Parmenides who's a rationalist and is going to insist that we think about it. <laughs> and that it's going to be surprising when we do. So yeah, sure. If you don't think too carefully about it, all of this makes sense. It seems to not be a problem. 
But as soon as you begin thinking about this, and it's, it, you couldn't start with simpler premises, that which is is and that which is not, and suddenly, boom, we're off to the races. That which is not can't be. You can't even speak sensibly about it. But these two-headed mortals on the way of doxa keep insisting on confusing being and non-being. Here are some of the ways in which they confuse being and non-being, and some of the ways in which this seemingly simple, and, and this is like weird, right? This whole non-being isn't, and so like you can't even talk sensibly about it. That's a little weird, but it's not earth-shattering yet. It's about to become earth-shattering. All right, here it comes. Ready? Brace yourself. You guys read it already. You tell me. Like, what's... Can we do this? <laughs> there is no... So we're saying, being is, non-being isn't, which is to say, there's no non-being, right? What about becoming? What about coming to be? What about perishing? In order to come into being, yeah, in order to become, first I have to not be and then go from not being to being. But in order to go from not being to being, I had to be in not being, and that makes no sense. That's total, like, bananas, mumbo jumbo. It, it's just words that mean nothing. Where were you before you were you? Ridiculous question, right? Yeah, some people like sperm and egg. That wasn't you, though, right? You want to travel? You want to travel far enough back? Like before you were sperm and egg, you were like a turkey sandwich on your dad's plate, and like, and a slice of pizza on your mom's plate, and like, but that's not you. That's something else, right? Those were those things were, and then they got eaten, and they ceased to be. They perished. And some new thing came into being. It came from, like, if we think of it in terms of, like, all right. And this was an issue that we were thinking of. It came up. Some people brought it up when we were talking about Anaximander, too, in the Aperon. And this idea of, like, the debt that's owed to the, to the unlimited when something becomes limited. It's got to go back. And some folks were like, but wait a minute. If something leaves the unlimited, then how infinite and unlimited is the unlimited? It's like missing something, and it has a debt. That doesn't make any sense. Same sort of thing going on here, too, where if we're saying, typically we think of, Maybe typically we think, of, if we think of being and non-being and becoming and perishing at all, do we think of it like this? Coming to be is like, first you were over here in non-being, and then you crossed over into being. And then when you perish, you go the other way. The problem with this that Parmenides is pointing out is that this isn't. There is no non-being. If there was non-being, then non-being would be being. And non-being can't be being. Not, not even close. You don't even have to think very hard to realize that non-being can't be being. It has to be non-being. No, there it, there, it, there it was, right? It has to be non-being. No, no, it can't be non-being even. It just isn't. There is no non-being. So this is the problem. No becoming, no coming to be, no perishing either. This is, this is like the first of these moves, where we start with the very obvious premise that which is is and that which is not is not, and we move on to something very surprising, which is, oh yeah, no coming to be and perishing. No coming to be and perishing means everything is all the time and unchanging too, right? We'll get to this in a second. Yes. Would you, would you mind, wait, let me pause you right there. Um, catch. Can you start that over again? But yeah, with the microphone. And you don't need to talk right into it, you just put it on your desk, it's fine. All right, um, so when you were talking about being and non-being is like two separate sides of like something. Yeah, like, like this, right? Some, some kind of plane, right? And becoming and perishing, you're like hopping between these two sides. Yeah. Is that, like it seems like a mistake to do that because not being is just not there. So even when we become and perish, it's still in this state of being, 
it's just like a different area of that being or something? So yeah, all right. So yeah, that's that's good. So we would say something like, yeah, maybe things don't come into being and perish. Maybe they just change, right? Yeah. May they always exist, but we're kind of like, you know, we're going from like turkey sandwich to sperm to me mm -hmm. to dirt to a tree. Yeah. And it's like only change, no actual coming to being or perishing, right? Except that like the next move that the goddess makes is, and there's no change. <laughs> because in order to change, we saw this with Heraclitus, right? You have to, like, give something back. Yeah, to change is to cease to be in one state and to come into being in another state. The turkey sandwich gets destroyed and the sperm gets created, right? Yeah. What, a, how, how, what a strange <laughs> example to be... This is recorded and it's going up on YouTube. My grandparents watch these videos sometimes. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, and no change either. And Heraclitus taught us why. This is like maybe like one of the few things that Parmenides and Heraclitus will agree on. That yeah, coming to be and perishing and change. These are the same thing. That's all change is. It's coming to be into one state, perishing another state. Like your previous state dies, the new one is born every time there's a change. But this can't be the case because that would involve us making this, this mistake here, right? The same mistake that we make when we think that coming to be and perishing is possible. Parmenides says it's not possible. The only way coming to be and perishing would be possible is if non-being was and non-being can't be. Same thing with change. You can't have any change. It confuses being and non-being tries to talk about non-being as if it were. There was a hand in the back. Yeah, no, 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 okay. Anything else besides change that gets thrown out the window here? Ooh, it got dark and obscure. Yes? Seemed like it came into being, right? So the question, um, in case it didn't get picked up, was, well, what about thought, right? And are you thinking specifically about thought, about like thinking new ideas? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the goddess would have, or what Parmenides would have said of this. He does speak about thinking. He says, and he speaks of it in a way that we would assume that a rationalist would, right? That thinking, when done correctly, reveals being as it is, reveals being as it is. Thinking doesn't make things, and we were kind of talking about this before, thinking doesn't make things just pop into existence, but through thinking we might reveal things the way that they actually are. In fact, he says, it is the same for thinking as it is for being. But he's going to insist that it actually be thought, whereas this stuff, saying like, can you think non-being is? Is that thinkable? Is it thinkable to think that which is not is? Yeah, so in this case we would, so Parmenides would be like, yeah, think, like, sure, like thinking is fine. In fact, I'm really big on thinking. Did you hear I'm a rationalist? I'm totally into thinking, but it's got to actually be thinkable thoughts. Not just words that come out of people's mouths. So non-being is, is not a thinkable thought. And if non-being is, is not a thinkable thought, then coming to be and perishing is not a thinkable thought. Because for things to come to be and perish, we have to make this weird confusion of being and non-being first. That's the only way, right? You have to not exist and then come into existence in order to come to be. Where did you come from? Non-being? Were you there, existing as a non-existent thing? Not a thinkable thought. It's incoherent. So I think, I don't, does that answer your question? No, not at all. It introduces more questions, perhaps.
Ah, yes. OK. All right. I think I can cut this off even, even earlier. Um, so what would, yeah, so what would Parmenides or the goddess say about the invention of the wheel? Yeah, and how the wheel was invented. First there was no wheel, and then somebody thought of it, and then there was a wheel. Yeah, they would say, there's no wheel. Yeah, that's just, like, it seems like there are wheels and that they were invented, but, like, no, there are no wheels. The reason why there are no wheels is related to the same reason why there's no becoming or perishing, also the same reason why there's no change. There's no change because... There's no becoming or perishing, and change is just becoming and perishing, right? Um, and there's no plurality of things. There are not many things at all. There's only one thing. Because in order for there to be many things, well, first of all, those many things, we typically think of them coming to be and perishing and changing. And like that's a, that's a problem that we've already mapped out. But in order for there to be multiple things, don't they have to be separate from one another? Like if I'm one thing and you're another thing, then we're not the same thing. Is that right? There's some kind of distinction. There's some separation between us. What's between us? Space, empty space? Full of nothing? Full of, full of non-existence being between us? Other things? Then what's between me and the other things, right? This is like, I'll, I'll go Zeno on you. If I'm like, what's between you and me? You'd be like, air. All right, what's between me and the air? More air? What's between me and the air that's really the closest air? Space? Is space a thing, or are things in space? Space is the absence of things. It's non-being. There's non-being in between us. The absence. It's the. There's an absence present between me and all the things that aren't me. What the? What is this absence that is present? Is this just another fancy way of saying non-being is? Incompet like none of this makes any sense, says the goddess. No, not, not this. Like this part all makes sense. If you just think about it carefully, you will realize that you don't have to think very carefully at all to know that that which is is and that which is not is not. But the consequences that come from that and just a little bit of paying attention with a goddess kind of leading the way for you will reveal that that means there's no coming to be, there's no perishing, and there's no change, and there are no pluralities of things. There's just one thing. And it's being. That's all being is. It's just like, that's, in fact, if we were to like, take this to its logical conclusion, there's only one sensible thing that you can say about the universe. It is. It is. That's it. It is. What's it like? Just, just is. And it's uniform. It's not more in one place and less in another place. It's a uniform, well-rounded sphere of being. You can think just like sitting there humming with the music of the spheres, just like that's, that's it. That's the truth. And then there's a way of seeming in which there are all kinds of opposites and we confuse being and non-being. Yes? Uh, so I just have a question. Um, like earlier when you were talking about the wheel, so would he actually be like, yeah, that's, that's not there? Like, would he like straight up like there's no, Yeah, there's just no wheel, right? Because in order for there to be a wheel, there would then have to be non wheels. And so as, like, a now there's a plurality of things. You would look at a wheel and be like, that's not there. I feel like that's kind of a reason. And it, goes, it gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> it's not only that Parmenides would look at a wheel and be like, that's not there. He would be like, there's no me. There's no me, there's no you, there's just being. Being, being. That's all. No me, no you, no goddess, no Parmenides. Matter of fact, no multiplicity of ways, right? No way of truth and way of seeming. No two-headed mortals and gods, none of this stuff. In fact, the whole story that the goddess is telling seems to like, almost be at risk of eating itself here now. 
And maybe this is what we're supposed to understand. Maybe this is the goddess is saying, like, you're, the way things seem is not the way that they are. Here, I'll get you started. And then at the end of it, it's just kind of like, it like kind of closes. It's like the, the snake that eats its tail or something like that. What do they call that? Ouroboros? Yeah. Ouroboros. So that's the way of truth. It's, at the end of the day, it's quite simple. That which is, is. You know, oh, and that which is not, nope, don't even. That's, that's, that's all that we did here in this whole big process was we started out with this and we flagged this one as we said, like, that one's kind of peculiar, the, it's weird, watch out for it. By the time we got through with it, we just pretty much said, like, yeah, like, let's just get rid of that and, like, that's, that's the point. That which is, is. And it seemed like something that wasn't particularly interesting the first time we said it, but by the time we've gone through the whole process, now that which is, is means something slightly different, which is to say, no coming to be, no perishing, no change, no plurality of things. Just one big, well-rounded, humming ball of being. And that's the way of truth for Parmenides. Some similarities between him and Heraclitus, they're both these weird little puzzles that, like, don't seem like much on their surface. You pick them up and you start to play with them and suddenly you're like, whoa, what is going on with this? That was weird. That's maybe about as far as it goes, some kind of like little stylistic quirk because substantively, they couldn't be more different from one another. Heraclitus says everything is in a constant state of change. Parmenides says there's no change. Heraclitus says there's no you, no unified you over time. And the reason for that is because you're constantly changing and each you is just momentary. Parmenides says there's no you because there's no separation between you and anything else. There's just being being. Which, you know, may sound in some respects, and we've been here before too, like sounds a little Eastern as well. Yeah. Yeah. That all of this separation from things is an illusion. And when you die, when you cease to be you, where do you go? And Axe Manor says, what, back to the Aperon? Where you're one with everything. And there is no me and you and separate things. There's no coming to be and perishing. There's just eternal being. This would, this would be the afterlife for somebody like Parmenides. You return, not return, you always, there always was a oneness. But you, uh, it's, it's even weird to talk about, isn't it? You thought that there was a separation between you and everything else. It was an illusion. It was a mistake that two-headed mortals make. A logical mistake, in fact. A mistake of confusing that which is with that which is not. But how, how could you make a mistake if there was no you, right? And if there is no, yeah, if there is, like you were on the wrong path. There aren't a multiplicity of paths. There's just one path. You think there's more than one path, but that's a two-headed mortal mistake. Wait, what's the statement about a two-headed mortal? I, I still don't know. Oh, this is the, the goddess refers to all the humans as two-headed mortals. They're two-headed because they are trying to hold on to both being and non-being at the same time. And they, and they confuse the two of them. And they say that there are... Things like, they say that there's night, and they say that there's day. And they say that there's male, and they say that there's female. And they say that there are all these differences and multiplicities. And they say that there's coming to be, and there's perishing, and there's change, and a plurality of things. And they're just wrong. They're confused about this. They walk around not knowing where they're going with confusion in their breasts because they can't tell the difference between being and non-being. And before you're like, what a bunch of silly people. Yeah, that's you. It's us. It's all of us, right? That's the way of seeming. The way of seeming is, the way of seeming doesn't need a whole lot of elaboration because we're all relatively familiar with it, right? And because at the end of the day, I don't know if there is, in fact, a way of seeming. Clever argument, no. I mean, ah, whatever. Didn't convince me. I ain't changing my mind. It is... The first time we've seen an argument quite like that in this class. We've seen like little, little nuggets, little fragments that are like pretty things to pick up and think about. 
But the argument that's on offer in the poem of Parmenides is one where it's not so much that we're invited to think through an idea as we're, we're led through it, right? We get the step-by-step -step instruction from the goddess. Parmenides had a student named Zeno of Elia. And Zeno pretty much adopted the same sorts of positions as his teacher did. That's why I refer to them collectively as the Eliatic monus. Eliatic monism is this articulation of this, this idea that there is no, there's no coming to be, there's no perishing, there's no change, there's no plurality of things, there's just a unity. And that's all that there is. It's, it's not even a specification of what that unity is made of. It might not even make sense to talk about it that way. It's just, it's a focus on unity itself as a metaphysical principle. And furthermore, I erased it already, but this explicit attention to things like being and non-being, this is a new step for philosophy as well. There's a whole new branch of philosophy that's born here called ontology, the study of being. Brought into existence, brought into existence by Parmenides, or it was always there, or there aren't a multiplicity of philosophical subdisciplines. Zeno, Parmenides' student, sought to prove the sorts of things that Parmenides was talking about and do it in just novel ways. As a matter of fact, we'll see in uh, the Platonic dialogue Parmenides, Socrates asks Zeno, aren't these all the same proof? Every time like, you like, say, like, here's another proof, here's another proof, here's another proof. They're all just the same proof, right? And they're all variations on a theme that kind of exploits some ambiguities that uh, appear in the idea of continuity or um, infinity, but a different kind of infinity than maybe we're accustomed to thinking about typically. Zeno had just a whole bunch of paradoxes, and they were all aiming at proving to us that the way that things seem to our senses is just absurd to rationality, completely incomprehensible, that we should just abandon the way that things seem and agree that they must be very different than that. If given this option between trusting to our senses or trusting to rationality, Zeno, like Parmenides, says, I'm going with rationality. We don't have even close to enough time to go through all of his paradoxes. They become uninteresting after the first couple anyway. You start to be like, oh, yeah, they're all the same thing. So we'll start with a, a very popular and easy one. This marker is terrible. There we go. Let's try Achilles and the tortoise. So there's Achilles. He's, he's big. He's got abs. Because he's Achilles. Oh, he hasn't started moving yet. It's a, it's a helmet with a, like feathers and stuff. All right, there's Achilles. We all know Achilles, right? He's half god. He's like very fast. Say what you will about Achilles and his ability to like contain his rage, but he's fast. And Achilles has a race with a tortoise. Oh, he needs a tail. All right, so it's Achilles versus the tortoise. And Achilles, because he's so fast and because he's such a nice guy, maybe he's not a nice guy, maybe he just wants to embarrass the tortoise. He says, all right, tortoise, have a head start. This is not a fair race because I'm so much faster than you. Why don't you go run out ahead a little bit and uh, we'll see who can get to the finish line first. And the tortoise is like, okay. All right, let's do this. 
tortoise makes off, and Achilles is sitting there, you know, like, mm, like, should I I'll eat a sandwich? Like, hey, how you doing? All right, I guess it's time to go. Achilles starts trying to catch up to the tortoise. No matter how fast Achilles is, it takes him some amount of time to get to where the tortoise is, right? Like he's not so fast that he instantaneously makes it. So Achilles runs from here to here. And in that process, it has taken a certain amount of time, right? Now, the tortoise is slow, but it's not completely standing still. So in this amount of time, the tortoise has moved forward. In fact, I'm going to track the tortoise in red here. So in that amount of time, the tortoise has moved to here now. So Achilles has not, in fact, caught up to the tortoise. But, you know, he's closer than he was before. So now Achilles is going to say, like, all right, so I, I caught up to where the tortoise was, but now he's moved forward. So now I'm going to catch up to the tortoise for realsies. <laughs> and so, yeah, he runs up to where the tortoise is now. And he's really, really fast, so he does it in a very small amount of time, but not zero amount of time. So in that amount of time, the tortoise has moved again. No problem, says Achilles. I'll just catch up now. But that takes some amount of time. And in that time, the tortoise has moved. No problem, says Achilles. I'll just catch up. And in that amount of time, the tortoise has moved. No, no problem. I'll just catch up some more. And in that amount of time, the tortoise has moved. Will he ever catch the tortoise? What, according to this? Like, according to the Logos, according to rationality itself, can he possibly catch the tortoise? Every time he does, the tortoise has moved forward. Well, we can imagine we just stop time, right? You do a little Zach Morris routine or like whatever. Um, what was that other show where the girl like touches her finger together and freezes time? Click, I didn't see that, but sure, click. Yeah, you just like, you pause the movie of reality and you're like, okay, now he's there. And in that time, or we could just say, like, it's because we're thinking of time and space as infinitely divisible, as continuous, that it seems like Achilles can never catch the tortoise. Yes? Seems that way, doesn't it? In fact, seems that way to anybody who's ever watched anybody catch up to something and pass it. That's your senses talking. This is the Logos talking. So much the worse for seeming. In fact, what, what Zeno concludes from this thought experiment, from this little paradoxical puzzle, is motion must be impossible. Motion must be impossible. And this is just a continuation of Parmenides, right? Motion is nothing more than change in place over time. And there is no change. Seems what, here, you want to see it a slightly different way? I'm going to walk from here to the window. But in order for me to walk from here to the window, first I got to make it to the halfway point, right? I got to make it to that halfway point before I get to the window. All right, so before I make it to that halfway point, I've got to make it to the halfway point to the halfway point, right? All right, before I make it to the halfway point to the halfway point, first I got to make it to the halfway point to the halfway point to the halfway point. Before I do that, I got to make it to the halfway point, halfway point, halfway point. Does it ever stop? Do I ever run out of halfway points? Yes. Who said yes? How would I run out of halfway points? Planck's length, yes, there it is, all right. We know this now. At the time, like, part of the problem here is we're thinking of space as continuous and infinitely divisible. These days, a lot of physicists say, yeah, well, the Planck length is actually, there's a, a lower limit to, like, how far things can move in space. There's, you can't infinitely divide space. There's a, there's a kind of a, a, a graininess to it, some folks will say. There's a discreteness to space, especially as things move through it. So this is, and in fact, um, some of the other stuff in the, let's see, this paradox, we can talk about the limit concept, and we can note that while the number of trips that Achilles has to make is infinite, and even Achilles can't do an infinite number of tasks, the number of trips Achilles needs to actually catch up to the tortoise 
is limitless. But we say, eh, as it approaches that infinity, the amount of time that it takes them to make each trip is getting infinitely small, is approaching zero. So we might talk about it that way. Literally a limit, right? Yeah, well, yeah, the mathematical concept of a limit. But let's be honest, like, that ain't going to be around, what, like, earliest, late 17th century with L'Hopital? Maybe the invention of the calculus in the 18th century? Some folks would argue that as a concept, it, it doesn't even really get clarified until 19th century mathematical analysis. If you're interested in the concept of infinity and the way that it works, we've got here not a big infinity, but lots of really tiny infinities. The, all of the infinities within things, right? Like the distance between one, zero and one is finite, right? It's just one unit. But how many divisions can you make in that? You can go forever and ever, right? There's, a, there's an infinity within that one unit. Um, this is the sort of thing that drove mathematicians nuts for a long, long time. If you're interested in this sort of thing, there are all kinds of books. David Foster Wallace, if you're a fan of him, has a great book on, on infinity, history of everything. Is it oblivion? Uh, nope. It's, uh, it's, a non, it's nonfiction. It's an essay. And it's, uh, it's called The History of Everything. Oh. Yeah. Or everything, no, that's not. Everything and more, I think is what it's called. Everything and more, a history of infinity. Just look up David Foster Wallace, infinity. Great book. Um, and all to make the same point that Parmenides was making. The way things seem doesn't make any sense if you stop and think about it. Therefore, so much the worse for the path of doxa. Let's forget about seeming. Let's just talk about the way that things make sense. This is an interesting dilemma. And one to kind of reflect on, I think, personally. If things seem one way, but it, that doesn't make any sense at all, what are you going to trust? The thing that makes sense? Then you're a rationalist too, I suppose, right? If you're like, I'm sticking with seeming. And we might think to ourselves, well, why, why would I do that? Well, because my senses deceive me sometimes. Sure, yeah, that's a possibility. Does rationality ever deceive you? No? Yes? No? Yes? We might, say, we might say something like, to those who say rationality can deceive you, we might say, only if you're not being careful. Only if you're making sloppy arguments. But if, you're, if you are careful, then yeah, I don't know if rationality can deceive you. What's that? The can't... The truth can't not be true? Right. Yeah, that, that would certainly be one way of looking. Yeah. When we're struggling to figure out, like, well, how do we get to the truth? What are, what are the tools that we're willing to trust in? And what happens when those tools conflict? Parmenides and Zeno are giving us an answer, the answer that the Eleatic Monists have on offer. Next, um, we're going to be reading the pluralists, who, as you might guess, are going to disagree with Parmenides on a few things. Um, they're actually looking to try to reconcile the, the, the pluralists. One way to think about them is that they're on board with the Eleatic project, or at least they, they get that it presents a huge problem, a problem that really needs to be solved, and the pluralists are going to attempt to solve it. We're also going to look at the sophists. We're not going to spend too much time on, except to kind of make a loose gesture towards, because Plato is going to talk about them a whole lot more. So keep your eyes peeled for a reading assignment and a reading quiz on the pluralists and the sophists. And then when we're done with that, we're done with the pre-Socratics, and we can start, we can start looking at the Socratics. <laughs> All right, see you all later.